There are four theme words in this first 15 verses of Galatians chapter 5. And uh, they all begin with the letter L. Liberty, law, love, and leaven. Now these words are interconnected and they teach us something very important and very practical. Uh, the L words, uh, list them up here on the screen for us so we can go through them one by one as kind of an introduction that will expand on them a little more. The first word is liberty. Paul talks here about uh, the liberty, the freedom of God's people from an evil bondage, a bondage to sin. It's not a liberty to do anything we want to do without consequences, and it's not a liberty to worship or to think about God in any way that just seems right to us. It's liberty to be the way we were created to be, and it's the only way that really satisfies our hearts, because that's the way God made us. The second word is law. The law of God shows us which things actually honor God and how God planned to redeem us. It spells out what's right and what's wrong, but the law can't get us to do the right things or give us faith in the coming Messiah. So the law actually condemns us, but then it points ahead by the sacrifices and all to the sacrifice of Jesus as the Lamb of God. The third word is love. God's love is what actually changes us and opens our eyes to see God's promises revealed in the law. And it's how, through Christ, we're delivered from the condemnation that the law reveals in us. And it's how we're made able, then, to honor God and to live the way we were created to be. By God's love, that being the cause, we are liberated from the chains of evil and delivered into godly freedom. And it's all by God's grace alone, not by anything of our own efforts. And, of course, the means to that was his coming and paying for our sins as our Messiah. But even when the gospel of grace comes into our life, we can't stop there. We need to be aware of the dangers around us that entice us to forget the liberation of grace. And so leaven is the fourth L word. And Paul uses it as an example of how little things can have devastating results. So in Galatians chapter 5, it begins with a reminder, the first L word, that we should not neglect the liberation that we have in Christ. Let me read those first six verses here. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, beginning, beginning at verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything by faith working through love. And that's really the key. So, first of all, when you trust in Christ alone uh, to make you right with God, you are liberated. Uh, you're set free from that burden of trying to meet impossible standards to be redeemed. Uh, and you're set free from the chains of evil and, uh, and all that guilt that comes along with it from the things that you've already done wrong. But instead of those enslavements, you become servants of a very kind and loving master. Uh, he took up your guilt and all the penalties that you deserve, and he made you part of his spiritual family. And he liberates you uh, because he forgives you and makes you alive again. And he fills uh, you up with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and, and, uh, and, and he loves you as one of his own. But we're not liberated from obligations to honor God and to live by his moral principles. Our liberation is from the foolish notion of merit by morals or by rituals. No one can ever earn his way back into God's favor. But God's law shows us that when we are honest about it, we deserve his wrath. Uh, we do wrong things. We don't have the right attitude when we do what we think are right things. And that's why Jesus had to come to pay our debt in our place. He satisfied all the demands of the law in the place of his people. And therefore, believers are set free from the curse of the law and into the joys of grace through Christ. So we as believers need to, to cling to that liberty of Christ, the one that he's earned for us. 
Now, the Gentile Christians in Galatia had at one time lived under the yoke of paganism. Uh, they'd been raised with heathen ideas and, uh, you know, they were idolizing prosperity and pleasure, worship, false gods. And then the gospel Christ of Christ came and set them free from all that. And they learned that what they do wasn't removing their guilt at all or giving them eternal life. It was something that Christ had earned for them. Then along came the Judaizers. And they were trying to entice them into another kind of salvation by works. Uh, the Gentiles left the yoke of paganism, but now they were being drawn into the yoke of rabbinical Judaism. Now the word yoke that's used there in the Hebrew expression is the Hebrew word ol. And it means the, the wooden beam that, that locked the oxen together into the plow. And it represented forced servitude and enslavement. The fallen heart is in bondage to the idea that we need to earn God's blessing. And uh, that perverts God's law into a method of removing guilt, and it was never intended to be that way. Only the work of Christ can remove our guilt. And so we come to the second word there, and the second word is law. The Judaizers were saying that all believers need to keep the ceremonial requirements of the law. But no one can keep the perfect standards of God's law. The law is there to expose our fallen nature, and it points ahead to the promised Messiah who would pay uh, for our guilt. Uh, shortly after the New Testament church began, there was a council that was called in Jerusalem. The apostles met together with some others to deal with this very struggling problem that they had of what to do with the old ceremonies now that the Gentiles were coming in and uh, salvation was a fulfillment of all those symbols that the rituals represented in the, uh, in the Levitical laws. And so they met together and uh, they warned this in Acts chapter 15, verse 10. It says, now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of his disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So the issue of circumcision was the main point. That old sign of God's covenant was now replaced by baptism. And Paul was reminding them that trusting in Christ alone is incompatible with relying upon circumcision. Dr. William Hendrickson, in his commentary, said a Christ supplemented is a Christ supplanted. Either they believe that Jesus Christ was the one who alone satisfies the law's demands for us, or they believe that the ceremonial laws didn't get fulfilled in Christ and still needed to be kept. So why stop at circumcision? Uh, to, man, to demand that brings you back into the whole ceremonial law, all the restrictions, all the rituals, all the dietary laws and everything else. Uh, it's to be re-enslaved again to the law works idea that now uh, that Christ has come, it doesn't mean anything. All the law was doing is pointing ahead to what Christ would one day do. And each of the little parts of that ceremonial law was to illustrate something about the work of Christ in establishing his church. But now that's been done. So to go back to the other brings you back into enslavement, but without the hope that Christ would be coming. And so it's to deny, essentially, the sufficiency of the work of Christ. And so Paul says that those who go back to the law have fallen from grace. He says that in verse 4 that we just read. It makes no sense for those believing in Christ to go back to the symbolism of the law. If they turned away from grace alone as what redeems them, then you know either they weren't really regenerated to begin with and to know that liberation that Christ brings, or they were being tragically deceived and forfeiting the blessings of living by God's principles. Well, we're not tempted in exactly the same ways today. We're not tempted by Judaizers to go back to the Old Testament rituals. That's not usually a problem we're confronted with here in the 21st century. But there are influences that can tempt us to think that God accepts us because of what we do. Some try to draw us into rit ritualistic religions. You know, they're nothing more than sort of sanctified superstitions. Uh, the sacraments are important. But they're not magical rites that automatically take your sins away. They're things that God set up and attach promises to that when we come to them with faith in Christ, recognizing his work for us, uh, those sacraments then can be a blessing to us. And he's used, he uses them then in his uh, work of grace. But they aren't the causes of our salvation, and they don't remove our guilt in and of themselves. Some uh, just get to repeating certain words in their prayers, almost like magic words, as if they somehow trigger blessings to be dispensed, if you just say it the right way or say these words. 
Uh, there, there's no sacred objects you can carry around that have blessings attached to them. No blessed things you wear around your neck or put on the dashboard of your car or put over your, your doors at home or whatever. There's nothing like that. Uh, nothing to protect you from sin and evil but the work of Christ. Crosses and statues won't keep you from accidents or illnesses or temptation. These are not ways revealed in the Bible. Nothing you do or touch or say carries the power to bring down God's blessings in and of themselves. God looks on the heart held captive by Christ, and he blesses because of what Jesus did for that person. So it's not your good deeds, uh, uh, conservative social attitudes, or uh, denial of personal comforts that makes you right with God. It's his grace alone that transforms your heart through Christ. And that's what moves you to love him and to love others, to do what's right out of thankful gratitude. And so Paul's warning us here not to get tangled up again in bondage. Uh, there's a natural tendency, I think, in us to become self-absorbed. Uh, we tend to think that our eternal destiny must be in some way in our own hands. But if you believe your outward deeds or words can earn God's blessings, you know, whether it's circumcision, sacraments, repeated prayers, sacred objects, social programs, then you deny the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ in redeeming you. Those who believe this false gospel, as Paul said here, have fallen from grace. Uh, instead of resting in God's provision, they think they have to earn it for themselves. And if this is a person's way of thinking about Christianity, the law condemns that person. They're rejecting what God's law in fact points toward and what it really meant. So in place of this self-caused salvation, God's word teaches us uh, that it's faith working by love. And love is the third L word in our list. By faith, hope in Christ, righteousness alone, a person is made right with the Creator. False religion teaches that if you love enough, you grow closer to God. But biblical religion teaches that when Christ brings you back into fellowship with God by love, then you learn to love as he loved you. Love and good deeds are fruits of grace and faith. They're not the cause or the root of it. Then Paul goes on and gives us some warnings here. In uh, verses 7 through 12, he reminds these people there in Galatia that at one time, the converted Gentiles who came to Christ were living as they really should as Christians before the Judaizers came. Let's take a look at that section here beginning at verse 7. <clears throat> here Paul writes, You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. So Paul here uh, had actually uh, seen the evidence of Christ's work in the lives of these Gentile Christians in Galatia. Uh, they came to believe in Christ, and he had confidence that by God's grace they'll go back to that former well-run race that he saw in them before these Judaizers came along and confused them. He wanted them to realize that a bad influence uh, was hindering them from living God's truth. But uh, it doesn't take much to ruin a good thing. Uh, a little too much sugar or salt can ruin a, a, a good tasting dish. A uh, bad tire can cause an accident that destroys a car and kills its passengers. A small leak in the gas line can cause an entire building to explode. Uh, or as Paul puts it here, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, leavening is like a little bit of yeast you put in bread. And a little tiny bit spreads through the whole loaf, and the whole loaf grows uh, as the, the leaven works in it. You know, I always remember uh, one of the old episodes of the I Love Lucy show. Uh, Ricky and Fred were trying to make bread, and they put too much yeast in it, too much leavening. <laughs> and as the, bed, the bread was baking, it came right out of the oven, 12 feet out into the room, uh, pushing them across the room as this big, huge loaf of bread came out with the way too much leaven. Of course, it wouldn't really work that way. But the point is, even what seems like a little deviation from God's truth can get your whole life going in the wrong direction. 
because everything seems to build upon uh, other things that we already believe. And by hoping in outward things you do, you forget the heart of the gospel. Don't count your uh, prayers or the minute you read the Bible thinking that if you just pray a little more or read a little more, uh, somehow it's going to give you more points or something. Uh, you need to look on your heart as you pray and as you read. Are you aware of the living Christ? Are you praying to the one who created you and died for you? Are you uh, reading the words of the very creator God who made all the heavens and the earth? Uh, we need to be very careful that we keep that inward part, trusting in him. We need to speak in faith to our God and remember that we're reading God's own word when we read our Bibles. And it's not rituals or practices that take away our guilt. Uh, no wonder that people have anxiety and depression in their lives if they forget that it's God's perfect love that redeems and keeps them. We need to leave worries at the cross of Christ where he paid for them in full. Benjamin Franklin uh, was famous for a little uh, lyric, limerick or whatever it was he put together. It says, For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, a rider was lost. For want of a rider, the battle was lost. And for want of a battle, a kingdom was lost. A little nail took out a horse, removed a rider from the battle, the battle was lost and the kingdom fell. All for that one nail in the horse's shoe. And that little nail could be the tiny thought in your heart that makes you think that you haven't done enough. Uh, to accept a misunderstanding of God's law, of the gospel, affects your whole life. It arranges your every attitude around a false starting point. You can't keep God's law enough to erase past sins. So give in to one point like that and you're condemned because you can't uh, do good enough. As James tells us in his second chapter, verse 10, whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. So Paul says that those who promote ideas like that will bear their own judgment. People sometimes approach God's word if they can choose what they like and ignore the rest. And without realizing how it affects their attitude to our God, people latch on to some wrong idea that gets them off track and away from the truth. And as God pointed out here through the Apostle Paul, it just takes a little error to set a life into a horrible spin out of control. Paul wanted them to understand that he was being persecuted for standing up for the truth. He could easily have compromised on that little point and allowed a little circumcision to continue. But to do that, it would destroy the whole gospel message. And so in the last part of this section, verses 13 to 15, Paul explained the boundaries of Christian liberty. Here now, beginning at verse 13. <clears throat> Paul says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. There's a lot in that portion of scripture. Uh, but the liberty we have in Christ isn't a liberty from Christ. It's not a liberation to be able to do whatever you want. It's liberation from bondage to error so that you can truly enjoy the freedom that you have to live by God's truth. And here's where it brings the focus back to the third L word, love. And if you notice in this section, it talks about love, it talks about liberty, it talks about law. And so he comes right back to it after he's talked about leaven. All four words are reflected in this last section. Love, as God speaks of it in his word, isn't a romantic moment or some emotional feeling. It's defined by his word as expressed in his law. The law, in the broad sense of the word, is what teaches us the perfect way which can't be followed aside from Christ. But it tells us how to love, how to honor God in our lives, how to live among others here in the world. And as Jesus explained uh, in his ministry here in John 14, 21, he said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And in Romans 13, 10, Paul said, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Some people say, oh, well, we just love. We don't have to have law anymore. Well, law 
isn't a means by which we uh, make ourselves right with God. It defines what love is, what it ought to be. If you love someone, you're not going to lie to them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to murder them. If you truly love your spouse, you're not going to go off and uh, commit adultery. You, if you love your parents, you'll honor your mother and your father. If you love God, you won't have other gods before him or make idols or neglect his Sabbath day or use his name in vain. We could go all the way through the, the moral principles that are summarized in the Ten Commandments. That's what he means here when he speaks of the law of love. It's filled in by what God has already revealed in his word and in his law. But the law was never meant to be a means by which we earn God's favor. It shows us how we're falling short. We can't always tell the truth. Uh, we, we can't because we're lost sinners. We're bound sometimes to hold back a little bit or to exaggerate or simply not tell the truth. We're bound sometimes to maybe take something that doesn't belong to us. It doesn't mean you shove something in your pocket in the grocery store, but it might mean that you cheat a little bit in a business deal or somebody makes a mistake with change and you kind of get a little grin on your face and walk away quickly. Uh, it doesn't have to be monetary. Sometimes we take the glory that belongs to someone else. Maybe we even steal the glory of God by giving ourselves credit when it's really God by His grace that's worked in our lives. And so it is that we need to be very, very careful that when we talk about love, we know what the Bible says love is. Biblically, here's how I define love. Love is an attitude implanted into our needful human hearts by the prevailing grace of God, whereby we are enabled to joyfully obey the revealed desires of our Creator both toward the Lord himself and toward those he created. And so when Christ works in you to move you to honor God and to treat others as he says, that's real love. You're putting that other person's spirituality and spiritual blessing above your own comfort. You love your wife so much that you'll live sacrificially to help her to grow in Christ and to enjoy his blessings. You love your children so much that you're willing to suffer a little bit so those children can grow up to love the Lord and to grow in grace and to do the things that truly honor the one who made them. And so when Christ works in us and he moves us to do those right things, his perfect love is shown in us and active in us. And his perfect love then is credited to us when we come to him by faith, by grace. And so he looks upon us and he gives us that ability to love others even as he loved us. But it's only as we first come to him as a result of his love to us. But he works in those whose hearts have been changed by grace so that they will then learn to strive to do what's right. And so we make sure now that these four key L words are active in our lives every day. We need to rest in the liberty that we have in Christ. We need not to be enslaved by the lie that we can earn our way to God's blessings Second, let God's law teach us and convict our hearts of that deep need for a Savior. Uh, we need to appreciate God's standards for worship and morality and see how the law points toward our Savior and uh, how he would come one day to die to redeem us. And the third word is love, as God defines it in his word, though. We need to rely on that power of the risen Savior that came out of love and grace alone to make us able to promote God's glory in all things and to stir us to live by his moral principles and to love God in return and to love our neighbor as ourself. And fourth, we don't want to let those little pieces of leaven, uh, wrong beliefs and wrong practices end up spoiling our whole life. Uh, we need to let his word identify the dangers and direct our steps along that narrow way that he points out. Now, uh, we're free from the chains of self-effort, guilt and anxiety for one reason only. Jesus Christ fulfilled the requirements of the law in our place and he lives in your heart to do what's absolutely impossible for you to do without him. And you can overcome all that depression and agony that you go through, uh, which are exaggerated uh, examples of focusing on yourself. It's really all that is. What you need to do is rather turn our attention to Jesus and rest in this gracious victory that delivers us. And that's how all four of these things come together. We're released from bondage to sin. We're released from bondage to that thing that we believe we have to do to make ourselves right with God. 
And the law tells us what those things are that please God. And it points ahead by the sacrificial laws to the one who will come and die in our place. And then we learn about love. How it is God's love that moved this whole thing. He loved us eternally before the foundations of the earth. And he set his, his love upon us in such a way that he would redeem each one of those whom he knew before the creation of the world that they should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then finally, of course, we need to get out the leaven. Don't let those little things in your life spoil the whole rest because one little wrong thing can be a seed that grows into a weed that chokes out your ability to truly understand the blessings that God promises you in his word. So let's uh, pray that the Lord will help us to understand these four things and above all else, to rest in Christ alone with great confidence that he has truly paid it all.